I'll start by introducing uh, Mr. Craig Nevin, who's going to be our moderator today, and he's going to try to keep us honest about our time and make sure that we get you out of here on time. Um, Craig is originally from Southern California and a former Associate General Counsel for a major real estate developer with corporate offices in Irvine. He practiced, he has practical experience as in-house counsel um, in the areas of construction, real estate development, and all aspects of business real estate. Craig uses his experience as in-house counsel and as corporate counsel to deliver excellent results for his clients. He developed and implements a litigation metric system that he provides uh, that provides accountability of counsel, uh, the programming of a return on investment, as well as an understanding of the litigation process for all of his clients. In addition to his law practice, Craig is a frequent lecturer and author in the areas of real estate and construction and has provided numerous seminars and trainings. He is a recognized expert and expert witness in mechanic liens. He has testified at both civil and criminal trials as an expert in real estate and is a former special master to the courts of San Francisco, Alameda, and Contra Costa Counties. I'd like to add, I testified as an expert in real estate in a murder trial. Mm -hmm. Tell you about it later. Uh, also speaking today is Kimberly Ferrando, also known to those who know her as Allie. Allie's an attorney with the Brother Smith firm's corporate real estate and transactional practice. She provides legal counsel to individuals and business entities through all stages of ownership and operation, including selection, formation, and reorganization, drafting and review of agreements mergers and acquisitions in real estate transactions. Allie received her BA in political science from Cal State University, Long Beach, where she began studying business law and obtained a certificate in legal studies. She then received her JD from University of Pacific, McGeorge School of Law in 2020. And while at McGeorge, Ms. Ferrando accomplished dual concentrations in business and intellectual property law. Sitting to my left is Michael Kaysen, which I wrote down phonetically. Thank phonetically, Kaysen, partner at Antero, Tomi, and Petrin at PC in Pleasant Hill. The boutique business and intellectual property firm uh, is in Pleasant Hill. Mike also teaches business law at DBC and started a free domestic violence clinic at DBC. He's a Rotarian and has made has many wide ranging interests and business experiences. Prior to law school, Mike was the owner of a successful <clears throat> children's consignment store in downtown Livermore, and before that, he has extensive experience and a background in real estate, including being a realtor, a notary, a loan officer. Mike maintains his real estate license, although his focus now is on business law, startups, and intellectual property-related issues. Interestingly, Mike is also a film producer, playwright, director, and professional actor. He received his JD from JFK University in Pleasant Hill, and a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from New York University. Having been there himself, Mike is particularly keen on helping startups grow, properly protecting intellectual property through patent, trademark, trade secret, and copyright, and in helping visionaries realize their dreams. Thank you, Craig, for reading that exactly as I wrote it. You're welcome. You're welcome. So uh, before we dive into the actual material, I'm going to give a little uh, plug again for CCCBA. Having uh, grown up in Orange County, LA, San Bernardino, practicing in all those counties, I still have a statewide practice, and I've never seen anything like the Bar Association in this county. There's probably four judges and four retired judges and justices uh, today, and it's a low attendance audience. There are events where you're at a 10 top, the swearing in, for example, where you're probably in a table with two former or current judges, justices. It's a bar association that has the bench in the bar like this. I've never seen it before. I don't think it exists in other counties. Um, and I was at a mixer. Uh, talking about corporations. Uh, I actually have a number of clients who are in their 80s and they're starting to realize it's not going to last forever, they're not going to last forever, and one or two have come in to me and said, hey, I've got this corporation, I formed it, or a lawyer formed it for me in 1982, uh, I'd like to sell it here, 
Um, and there's nothing there. There's a corporation, but nothing else. Um, so at this mixer, I was talking to uh, these two Juris Doctors, which is how we got the entire medical theme of this course going, and said, how do you bring life back to an uh, old corporation? Can't we do a Benjamin Button uh, therapy on this person, make them younger, make them able to be sold? Because right now, nobody is going to buy them in their current shape. Uh, or want to take over if you're a son of a corporate or son of a corporate former formation. Uh, it just it, 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 I struggled with it, and both of these two doctors, Jewish doctors, sorry, had answers. They do it all the time. Um, so uh, that's how the idea was born. Um, what I realized in this is as a mechanics lean, and construction litigator, you're looking forward. The mechanics lien timeline is always going forward, depending on date of start, date of completion, when you record, when you file. What these two doctors do is they look backwards, and you'll see the difference in, in what they do to triage and then treat. Get all the medical uh, terminology down. Uh, these corporations that might not be in the best of health. Um, so that's how that came to be, and uh, before we dig in, um, would you give us please a just a little bit of each patient that we're going to see? Absolutely. Of the three patients. So today we're talking about sort of three case studies, our three patients um, who are currently in the ER waiting for our assistance as uh, these doctors. Uh, so today we're going to meet uh, one corporation uh, who's got a sole shareholder with the goal of retiring. We've got a nonprofit corporation who has uh, entered into or is going through the grant process and therefore is kind of raising, risen concerns about their corporate formalities and their corporate compliance. And an LLC who two owners are getting divorced and what is the fallout from those two members and their ownership interest. So those are the three that we're going to be talking about today. But we did want to start with just a general discussion of what exactly are corporate formalities. So we've divided these into those corporate formalities enforced by law and those enforced by the governing documents of the business entity. So we've got um, in our program materials a lot more detail, a lot more citations to code, which I'm not going to read you for verbatim, um, but generally uh, the California Corporations Code requires that there be annual shareholder meetings, that there be regular election of board of directors of a corporation, uh, that there be meeting minutes from those shareholder and board of director meetings, that the corporation maintain accurate books and records. You are required to file uh, annual statements of information as a corporation and biannual as an LLC. You are required to have at least three officers, those being the chairman of the board, the president and the secretary, uh, the, sorry, chairman of the board and or president, secretary and chief financial officer. And for LLCs, we'll get into a discussion later of how LLCs differ from corporations, um, but you are required to adopt an operating agreement. And then in addition to all of the things that are required by law, there are also things that are just good business practices that you should have as part of your documentation, including when are the meetings, right? So the time and place of meetings are really important for corporations. Um, any notices given, right? So you have to notice your shareholders when those meetings take place. Um, the number of authorized directors, you wanna make sure that you have the correct number of the code section and also um, who those members are, right? So who those directors are, super important. And then you know, are there any additional officers um, that may be operating that aren't in the bylaws or vice versa, right? So one of the things I like to do when I write my bylaws for a company is add a little section in the officers that add a vice president. So it's in the bylaws, but we don't actually need a vice president as per the code. So is someone like that um, coming to the meetings? And if they're coming to the meetings, or are, are they, have they been elected? Um, you want to make sure that it matches, right? So, it's low-hanging fruit, but why follow all these formalities? 
So the observation of corporate formalities um, as attorneys, we feel, is heavily important. Our clients may not feel the same and don't always love to do their corporate formalities, which is how we end up with the Benjamin Button situation, as we'll discuss. Uh, the first reason to observe corporate formalities is to promote good record-keeping practices. It also preserves what we often call the corporate memory. So this comes into play if you're ever in a lawsuit, you get a request for production of documents, most likely a lot of those requests for production of documents are going to be things like your minutes, like your bylaws, and you want to have those documents at the ready. But also, if you're going to sell your business, that due diligence period is also going to require you to produce a fair amount of documents. So to have those already in your corporate book, already organized, already put together, will help make that process much smoother. But the big reason that most people know is the preservation of the corporate veil. Um, I told Mike and Craig uh, that I have a friend that practices in employment law. She knows nothing about business law. She went and formed an LLC that she's going to have a side business with her friends. And she didn't consult me about it at all, which I was a little bit offended by, being that she knows what I do on a daily. Um, and so after the fact, she comes to me and she's like, so, you know, I, I did this and I'll, all I know is that I don't want to pierce the corporate veil. That's all I remember from law school and I'm terrified of it. Well, in reality, piercing the corporate veil is a pretty hard metric to meet and a pretty hard thing to prove to get to the point where there is personal liability of your members of an LLC, your managers, your officers, directors, and shareholders. However, uh, the failure to observe corporate formalities is one of those factors that could lead to the piercing of the corporate veil. So before uh, uh, I'm playing the emergency room supervisor, before I bring you your first uh, patient, who, who in the room has formed a business entity of any type? Raise your hand, please. Ever. David's oh, okay. not paying attention, okay. but I know who, he has. Who, who, have, who has ever had to do triage or treatment on a business entity? All right. All three of them. We got a couple. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Ferrando, uh, I'd like you to go down to, uh, what do they call it in the ER, uh, bed number two. There's a patient there. You've described him uh, only briefly as a corporation. Yes. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to call this one for all intents and purposes our dated corporation. And this is kind of the best example of what we're calling a bit of a Benjamin Button. So this is a California corporation. They were incorporated in 1989. Their tax status is there, they've elected to be taxed as an S corporation. Their line of business is they're engaged in construction. Their ownership is a single shareholder. Do you want to take that? Sure. I'll let you take that. <laughs> so, so real quick for those of you guys who aren't familiar with the, um, the difference between a C corp and an S corp. A C corp is taxed twice, once on the dividends earned and once on your personal um, the dividends paid to you as an individual, so it's, we call it double taxation. The S Corp is taxed as an LLC, or similar to an LLC, where um, it's taxed, uh, it's a pass-through tax structure, so you get taxed on your personal income tax uh, through a K-1 at the end of every year. So it's basically the best of both worlds, in my opinion, right? So you, you have the corporate structure, but you also have the S election. And the reason why I wanted to bring it up real quick, sorry, no. um, is because one of the things that I've come across often is uh, an S Corp thinking that they're an S Corp, but they're not actually an S Corp, they're a C Corp because they never filed the S election. And so it's a one or two page document that you file with the IRS basically saying that you're um, taxed, um, you want to be taxed as an escort. So it's something to look out for. Very important upon formation too. It's one of those documents that because time-wise I believe you have to file it within 30 days. 30 days of formation or within, what is it? it? It's something like 45 days of the beginning of that tax year that you are requesting to be taxed as an S-corporation. Don't quote me on that one, but it's certainly about 30 days after um, formation. So we have our... If, if I may, yeah. um, in the emergency room, you may have all the medical records downloaded, but before your client comes in, back to being a lawyer, what do you do to make sure that you get everything and can do a diagnostic? So we have now met our patient, the corporation, um, but our actual client is going to be this single shareholder. And first thing that we're going to do is have a consultation with this client. 
Upon this consultation, we're going to ask that they give us their corporate book, any governing documents, any shareholder buy-sell agreements. Obviously, in this situation with a single shareholder, it's unlikely that they're going to have a buy-sell agreement, but if you're dealing with multiple shareholders, any pre-existing agreements between those shareholders with respect to how shares are sold, transferred, um, and dealt with upon triggering events is incredibly important to look at. During the consult, we want to learn um, the corporation's principal line of business, which we've already established, is construction. Where the corporation does business and where it's registered to do business, any fictitious business names that the corporation may have, any parent or subsidiary companies of the corporation, the identities of the key officers, directors, and shareholders, their success and goals. So as I previously introduced, uh, this client has come to us really with no concerns about the corporation itself, but more so with their succession planning and their goal to retire. What do you do next? And uh, lastly, being any pre-existing succession plans. So uh, the next thing really is to dive into these corporate records and to really take an analysis of how they are combined with their corporate formalities. Um, and this is where we sort of get to our Benjamin Button analogy of you really don't know much about this corporation until you get a look at all their records. And on the outside, you know that it's been formed in 1989. It's been around for quite a while. But when you start looking at the records, there's not a whole lot there. And all of a sudden, now you thought you were looking at an old, an elderly corporation, but you're actually looking at in its infancy because they have maybe the bare minimum that was required to uh, form the corporation. So say that they filed their articles, um, but they've got minimal annual meeting minutes, <coughs> they've got bylaws, but other than that, there's not a whole lot to work with. So uh, I sort of think of doing a corporate review, a corporate compliance review, a corporate audit, however you want to refer to it, as going through the steps, uh, what I think is chronologically. So I always start with the articles. I verified the date that the, sec that the articles were filed with the Secretary of State. In their corporate records, I'm going to locate if they have any amendments to those articles and make sure that the articles were also, or the amended articles, were also filed with the Secretary of State. I'm going to verify the name of the corporation as, as registered with the Secretary of State. And I'm always going to note the number of authorized shares because that's going to come in handy when we're reviewing their stock certificates later on. For the bylaws, I'm going to pay attention to the principal office of the corporation, how many directors are mandated by the bylaws, when and at what frequency the meetings of the shareholders and the board are to occur. It might be that the bylaws spell out that they're required annually or quarterly or that there's a specific date, say November 1st of every year is when the shareholder meeting is to take place. What officer roles are required by the bylaws, if there are additional roles other than those required by law? By law, bylaws, kind of like that. Uh, what policies exist for vacancies on the board or in the officer roles? And I'm going to find any amendments that there might be to the bylaws. Then I'm going to look at the most recent statement of information that was filed with the Secretary of State. I'm going to verify the status of the corporation with the Secretary of State and with the Franchise Tax Board. I don't know about you, but every time that I look at a business entity on biz file and I see a big red late date or a not good status, uh, it's never fun. And so that's something that we want to pay attention to. Uh, I'll verify that the Secretary of State has the most updated addresses of the corporation, who the agent for service of process is, and I'm going to note who the officers and directors are as reported on the most recent statement of information, but I'm going to take that with a bit of a grain of salt. Then I will start looking at the minutes, and this is probably one of the most content-heavy sections, or should be a content-heavy section of a corporate book. Uh, I'm going to pay attention to whether they have observed their requirement to hold annual shareholder meetings, have they kept minutes for each of those meetings, uh, do the last written consents electing the directors match the directors that are listed on their current statement of information? How often is the board required to meet? Has the board kept their minutes? Um, and have any minutes been lost, misplaced, stolen, destroyed, what may have you? Uh, then we're going to look to the stock certificates and their stock ledger. 
We want to see who are the shareholders, does that align with who our understanding of who the shareholders are? How many total shares are there? Are there shares uh, in excess or in alignment with how many they are authorized to issue by the articles? How are the shares being held? Are they being held by individuals, by other entities, by trusts? Uh, and then we're going to move to, as I mentioned earlier, any shareholder buy-sell agreements. What are the terms of how they may transfer shares, how they sell shares, what are triggering events? Does the corporation or other shareholders have right of first refusal uh, when there's going to be a sell of shares? And uh, what, what are those triggering events, how the shares move around? So you've taken all the vitals, you've looked at the medical records or the corporate records. Looked at the, the chart, if you will. What happens next? So uh, next we're kind of going to go through our treatment plan. So if they have a suspended status with the Secretary of State or the Franchise Tax Board, that's always going to be one of my first steps. So that's a big issue. I've dealt with that before. Of um, Somebody is potentially going to be in a lawsuit, but they've got a suspended status. Really, that means that they can't defend themselves in a lawsuit if they're not a valid entity at that point. So that's going to be one of my first things to pay attention to. Um, then, as we discussed, uh, so this corporation will say, does business in Contra Costa County, in California, no other states, and they are they incorporated in California, so they don't need to register as a foreign uh, entity doing business in other states, and any fictitious business name. So if they've got a fictitious business name, um, it needs to be registered or it should be registered in the county in which they are doing business under that name. If I may, Dr. Okay. Tyson, what do you uh, find if you see a Delaware patient or corporation? Yeah, so a lot of times what will happen is you'll have a Delaware corporation because for some reason everybody wants to incorporate in Delaware. Um, I still have not figured out why. Uh, I think Delaware is supposed to have stronger um, requirements for or stronger laws that protect the investor. So a lot of investors want a, a Delaware corporation. But um, other than that, I think California rules are just as good. And the problem is if you register in Delaware, right, so you're a Delaware C Corp, you still have to, if you're doing business in California, you still have to register as a foreign entity in California. So now you're paying for both Delaware and for California. So why not just start in California and if you need to, then go to Delaware, right? Because you're gonna end up paying less. So a lot of times what happens is people don't know that, and so they'll start a, co a corporation in Delaware and say, yeah, we're in Delaware, we're Delaware C Corp. And I say, great, but you're doing business in California and you've never filed your foreign entity status in California, so you're, you're, not, uh, you're, you're, <laughs> you're breaking the law, right? Um, so you have to file as a foreign corporation as well. So when you look at that all important business search through the California Secretary of State website, <laughs> you're gonna wanna know um, whether or not they're filed, you want to look for whether or not they're filed in um, as a foreign corporate entity in California. If they're, if you know that they're Delaware. Excellent. Excellent. And we can certainly get into the definition of what qualifies doing business, but you should be registered in any state that you are doing business in. Um, and similar concept with the fictitious business names. If you're doing business under a fictitious business name, if you have an office location in two different counties and you know you see clients, customers, you make sales in those counties, it's the best practice to register that fictitious business name with counties, which depending on the county can be an easy or not so easy process. I'm not a fan of Contra Costa County's way of going about it. I prefer Alameda. Um, so then we're going to ensure compliance with California law and the governing documents. So say that we have taken a look at these bylaws and the bylaws require that they have five directors. Probably an unlikely scenario with a single shareholder corporation, but let's pretend for the moment. Um, and their most recent statement of information only has three members of the board. Well, that means that we have a vacancy on the board and we now need to hold a meeting of the shareholders to elect directors to fill those vacancies on the board, or we need to do the opposite and we need to amend the bylaws to provide for less directors so that we can make sure that they're in compliance with both California law and with their own governing documents. 
California Corporations Code does require that if you have one shareholder, you have to have at least one member of the board. If you've got two shareholders, two members of the board, three shareholders, three members of the board, after three, they don't seem to care. Um, so if necessary, you want to amend the bylaws, and Mike and I and Craig had a discussion about aspirational bylaws versus um, what <laughs> maybe uh, is the more general. So we want to make sure that your bylaws really fit the needs of the entity and not that the bylaws are just something that you think that you should be doing. Yeah, so I've had a lot of instances where <laughs> you look at a corporation and they tell you what they're doing. Oh, we're doing these meetings and we're, we're electing these officers and they're, we're doing all of these things. And then they say, but we don't know if it fits our bylaws. And I read the bylaws and the bylaws are totally different than what they're actually doing. Well, bylaws are an internal document, right? So if they're an internal document, that means that you can amend them. And you're not submitting them to the Secretary of State. It's, it's all for the internal organization of the business. So let's make the bylaws fit the corporation so we can amend the bylaws to actually say what it is that they're doing we just have to have a meeting for that amendment right that's it excellent treatment um and then similar procedure for uh the officers of the corporation if they have their three officers that they're required to have by law but say that their bylaws like mike uh said also says that they have to have a vice president um if we have a vacancy in that vice president role then we need to similarly hold a meeting of the board of directors and elect those officers uh, that are mandated by both law and governing documents. So then we're going to uh, conduct a diligent search for any missing meeting, missing, missing <coughs> meetings of the shareholders or the board. Um, this is probably the biggest issue that I see in my practice is uh, entities, and especially when you're dealing with a situation like a sole shareholder, He's like, what do you mean I have to have a meeting? It's just me. You want me to sit down and talk to myself and write it down? Um, so a lot of the time I find that, you know, those, those, or even with two shareholders, those meetings did take place. They are meeting, they are regularly discussing their business, but they're maybe just not reducing it down to actual written minutes. What do you do? So in a situation where we're missing many years of required annual shareholder minutes, uh, we would probably put together a uh, affidavit or a declaration of the secretary of the corporation to say that they've done a diligent search, they haven't been able to locate those missing minutes, and that the minutes have either been lost, destroyed, or misplaced. And what we're gonna do going forward is adopt better corporate formalities and ensure that going forward, we do them annually. That was the analogy of triage and long-term health. Absolutely. Um, and then, uh, so if it's in, also in this process, if the bylaws mandate a specific time of year that the annual meeting is going to occur, if it's the proper time, we can notice and hold an annual meeting of the shareholders. And although not required by law, it usually is just a best practice to have your board of directors meeting follow that so that you have an annual board of directors meeting as well. And then after we do all of that, we elect officers, we elect directors, uh, we reduce it to meeting minutes, we hold any annual meetings that need to take place, then we can file an amended statement of information with the Secretary of State. That will get us up to date, give the state the most current information, and then you don't have to do it again for another year. Or until there's a change on the directors or the officers, at which time you should always update the Secretary of State anytime an address changes, anytime an officer or director changes. Time is free. So this uh, patient... It's, it's not. It's, it is. Uh, Absolutely. The statement so, of information is twenty dollars. No. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that, so if you file um, uh, an amended statement of information, oh, you mean within, not okay. within a year Fair. of the of the first time you file, it's free. So, you know, I it's you know, a service I actually offer my clients, and I say, listen, if you want have any changes, let me know. We'll file, and I don't charge them to file because I, I want to know what the documents are, and I want to I want to keep up to date with my patients. Um, but it, it's a really good way, it's a really good offering. I, I highly recommend it to any business attorney because then people will call, you'll be more inclined to call you. So the, the patient is uh, ready to leave the emergency room? Not quite. For I have to cut you off there. Okay. We do have to first verify um, and sort of make sure that the stock certificates and the stock ledgers of the corporation are 
uh, copacetic that the shares are held by who we want it to be held by. So say this uh, single shareholder uh, holds it individually in his own name, but he actually would prefer it to be in his trust. We might need to do an assignment to the trust. Um, and this is where we want to confirm they're not exceeding their amount of authorized shares um, and that all of the stocks are in alignment with how they are. Thank you. Now, my final patient, point. Sorry. Now this patient it. is uh, ready to be released from the emergency room, but you probably have a follow up in a week to talk about why they originally came in. Yes. So they originally came in um, with the goal of succession planning and really uh, looking towards retirement. And uh, what I most commonly see in my office is somebody who's looking to retire and is looking to pass on the family business and wants to get their kids involved. Um, and hopefully those kids want to be involved. Um, so then we can start looking at succession planning. I always kind of want to define what is a reasonable timeline for that succession plan um, and then determine if there's going to be a transfer or a sale. You know, if it's going to children, are the children buying those stocks or are they uh, gifting them? And so we're going to prepare any relevant documents that might uh, coexist with that transaction. And if uh, there's a scenario where that single shareholder, our original client, really wants to stay on and help with the transition, uh, maybe we do something like we make that person a employee. We give them a nominal position and pay them a salary so that they can help with those transition efforts, but they're no longer the one running the show. Um, but they're still there to help with the historical knowledge of the corporation um, and facilitate that transfer. What about uh, if they're concerned about losing their voting block before they're paid by their buyer? So in that situation, uh, we would probably recommend that we do more so a progressive buyout or a progressive gifting of shares rather than having them gift all of the shares or sell all the shares from day one and be completely out as a shareholder. Uh, so maybe we do a progressive plan where their percentage of ownership of the company is slowly reduced so that they still have a vote uh, in order to elect directors and make decisions on behalf of the corporation. Can your share, can your voting ever be uh, contrary to the amount of shares that you have? Absolutely. How do you do that? That would sort of bring us into the realm of having a, either a shareholder voting agreement, um, a buy-sell <laughs> agreement, whatever sort of agreements between the shareholders, if multiple exist at the time, of how are they going to handle voting between them? Did you have another, I think we talked about this the other day, of another plan maybe for... A restricted stock purchase plan? Go ahead. <clears throat> so uh, the other, another way to do it is uh, a restricted stock purchase plan. So let's say, the owner is selling and you want to keep them involved in the company for a, a while, what you can put in place is a restricted stock purchase plan where they get shares or they get their shares uh, basically back um, over uh, a period of time. So let's say it's two years and they have 200,000 shares. So um, you do, what's that, 50,000 shares a year where they get, they get those back as long as they're with the company. Make sense? They get, they give them the By control. working, so they're working for the company, and as part of their salary or the part of their compensation, more of a earn out rather than a buyout. Exactly, it's an earn out. Yeah, that's a really good way to put that. <laughs> uh, so you you by staying with the company, you you're earning your shares, and and most of these owners want to stay with the company that they built. So it's absolutely it's provides a, really a lot of continuity as well. Yeah, that institution, institutional memory is really important. Is there anything else in the succession plan that you want to point out? Obviously, I always recommend working with an estate planning attorney in conjunction to this so that any uh, trust and estate plans match up with the succession. Um, I am not an estate planning attorney, uh, but there is an afternoon session that I believe touches on this as well. It does. So, uh, it sounds like patient one is in good health and now much better off. Ready to be transacted. We hope. Um, Mike, why don't you move to patient two? Cool. We have some uh, details. So, before we get into um, patient number two, um, which is a nonprofit, does anybody work with nonprofits? So I, I'm not going to spend a little bit. So, and that's the answer I get most of the time is if you're a business attorney and you don't want to touch nonprofits because you're afraid of the tax implications, right? You're afraid that you're not doing it correctly or 
you know, that you you miss something or, you know, um, the liability is too great. There's a whole bunch of, bunch of reasons that I've heard as to why you don't want to touch a nonprofit. But the truth of the matter is, nonprofits are great. I love working with nonprofits. Um, and because they're doing something good, they're giving back to the community, um, they're serving somehow. And the biggest problem that I've seen with nonprofits is that what happens, so I work with a lot of boosters, right, school boosters, and what happens is the kids go away, the people who are in charge are no longer involved in the booster, and now the new people coming on board have no idea what's going on. Um, so they don't, so I get this, this book, just like what Ali was talking about, that has you know, minutes in it, but you can't find the records. Like you can't actually find the tax ID number, or are they issuing a tax ID number, or whatever the case might be. And so it's really just going back in time and figuring out, all right, do they have one? And then if they have one, um, great. If they don't have one, then you gotta fill out the paperwork, submit it with the IRS, and then you get one. Um, and it's really that simple. So, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and if you go into business law, and if it's something that you do, hanging your shingle out and saying, hey, I do nonprofit work too, um, I think it's a really rewarding area of this practice. Um, Can you dig into the yeah, consult let's, and the treatment? Thing? Yeah, let's do it. So patient number two is an, um, a nonprofit, and so the, it's, the state of incorporation is California. It was in uh, 2009. Uh, they say they're a nonprofit, but you don't know because you haven't dug in deep yet. Um, they collect money for DNA research. Pretty cool. Um, and you have an ownership board. Well, it's not an owner because it's a nonprofit. So, um, but it's uh, you have a board of three, um, and they come to you and they say, "We don't have any idea. We've been around forever, and we don't know uh, what our status is." And uh, they're looking for money, right? So, a lot of nonprofits. They're trying to get money for grants, and as part of the grant process, they have to provide their documentation. Make sense? All right, so again, it's a lot like what Ali was talking about. You have to dig deep. You have to go back through their corporate records, and you have to see, well, it, what, what's in their corporate binder? What documents have been filed? Do they have a federal tax ID number? That's key, right? So the IRS, when people say, I'm, I'm a 501c3, <laughs> They don't really know what that means. <laughs> um, so there are other organizations, other types of organizations, like a 501c4, or which is a social club. Or um, so a 501c3 basically means that it's a charity, right? That they're giving back to the community in some some way, and they meet one of nine requirements from the IRS. And the IRS, right? So the federal government is saying, okay. Because you're giving back to the community in this way, either it's an educational institution, it's a... Um, um, I know, I'm trying to think of the ones as well. Right, right, right. So, um, it's educational, social... Uh, not social, but it's a church, right? Yes, so, religious. So um, uh, sports, um, uh, scholarships, right? So if it's one of it's one of nine, so you've got to like figure out what, well what is it? This would be medical because it's DNA research, right? So um, so if they're giving back in one of these nine aspects, then they can be apply for tax exemption, and as tax exemption they don't have to pay their well um, they still have to pay taxes, but they they may not have to pay as much in taxes, right? So tax exempt doesn't necessarily mean that you're not paying any taxes. So you still have to file a 990EZ every year. Even if you don't make any money, um, you have to claim what money that you are bringing in. Does that make sense? All right, and then, um, so you've got your, uh, then you have your state. So even though, you, remember when we pay taxes, we pay federal and we pay state. So you have to get your tax exempt status through the state, right, um, and then, uh, you, you pay your taxes every every year, and then your CT1 form is this little postcard that you get that you send into the state that basically says um, uh, that you exist and what you're doing in it. It basically is it's kind of a non select order, but you have to fill it in every year. The CT1 is with the 
attorney general's office, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a division of charitable trust. Yes. So it's the division of charitable trust. And, and you have to register as a charitable trust through the attorney general, okay? So there's really four things that you have to do to be tax exempt or to be um, legally uh, a charity in, the, in California, right? You're filing with the IRS, you're filing with the state, you're filing with the attorney general, and you're uh, paying your taxes, or at least you're, what you're claiming to be your taxes. That's it, four things. What happens is one of those four things isn't done, or multiple of those four things isn't done. So in our patient case here, we've learned that all they've done is file their initial document with the Cal their initial articles of organization or incorporation, because it's a corporate, uh, charities that look like corporations. Um, so they follow their articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State. That's it, right? So they've been around since 2009, operating as a charity without filing any of the other documents. That's a problem, right? So how do we fix that problem? So what do we do? What do you guys think we do? What do we do first? Come on, what do we do? This is you your file some, You file something with the IRS in order to verify that they haven't filed anything? You file something with the IRS, yep. Call absolutely. their CPA. You can call their CPA. Let the CPA yeah. get that for you. Um, they so, don't have that, they're in trouble. I love to be able to push things off on CPAs. It's my favorite thing. Um, but you're right. You file with the IRS. So you file a 1023 um, or um, form. Is it the 10? Yeah. Um, with the IRS. And you basically go through all of the different, you know, they ask you a bunch of questions. And you file it um, and you figure out, all right, so they're medical, so you put that in there and make sure that that gets filed with the IRS and now you're good to go there. Now what? So you file with the IRS, what do you do next? Same thing with the state. Same, Same thing, thing with, with the, the state, right? You file the 3223 form with the, with the state and you say, hey, we've been operating since 2009. Um, you tell them how much money they've earned and you file that with the, uh, with the state. What do you do next? The AG's office. There you go, there's your file with the AG. So that's it. So even though it's later, right? Even though they were filed in 2009 or they thought they were around since 2009 and you're getting this in 2023, you can still file all of the same documents, right? It's the same order, it's the same. <laughs> or what do you think? What? Well, if they haven't filed the proper tax requests in the beginning, they may owe a bunch of taxes to the IRS and then the exemption would be forward going, it's not backward looking, depending on what they've done. That's true. So you do have to get your the CPA involved and Which they have causes to Which causes other problems because if a donor donated money assuming they could take a tax deduction, you've got to contact all your donors. True. So um, you still have to go through and you have to, uh, so you have to look at how much money they've earned, you have to talk to their CPA. Um, fortunately, like, the organizations that I've worked with, if it, um, there was one that was just like this, except it wasn't a DNA company, but, um, and uh, they never tried to collect any money, right? So it wasn't an issue, because we just filed all the back taxes, which was zero, and, um, and we were good to go. But yes, if, if there's money involved, right, and all of the donors believed that they um, uh, were, were sending money into uh, a charity and it wasn't an actual charity, then you have to inform the donors, let them know, and then um, it's retroactive for up to a year. So. so then after you've dealt with any tax issues and you've uh, gotten the CPA involved where they should have been, um, what, what sort of differences do you find in corporate governing documents, if any? What do you do internally? So, uh, oh yeah, so for, for the documents themselves, you still need your, um, your bylaws, um, so write the internal document that says how it's run. In the bylaws, because, like I said, the problem is that everybody kind of goes away at the same time, and then new people come in at the same time. One of the things I would recommend is to do a staggered board. So you have um, one group of usually two serving for three years, one group of two serving for two years, right? And then, um, so you have the two year term, they, they term out after two years, so you have two people remaining, 
right? Because they're serving for three years, and then you elect those new two people for the next two years. So now every term is, is a two-year term, but every year you're electing new people so that you get the institutional memory from the years before. So that's a really good trick in order to keep the institutional memory going forward so that you don't have everybody terming out at the same time, and so you have somebody who remembers what, what was done. And can you amend the bylaws to do that? Yeah, so just like the corporation, I mean, Ali nailed it, right? So um, just like a corporation, you can amend the bylaws at any time. It's an internal document, right? So you can always say, this is what you guys are doing. Let's, let's uh, make the bylaws fit what you're doing versus make the business fit the bylaws. So anecdotally, um, I actually did a review, a corporate compliance review of the nonprofit recently, and um, they, their organization is for the purpose of education for, I believe it's like pre-1700s uh, events, and so they do uh, recreation events, and um, they gave me thousands of pages of documents, and luckily it was in PDF, so I wasn't having to actually shuffle through papers. And um, their uh, bylaws and their actual corporate governing documents that you would typically see from any organization were actually mixed in with their society governing documents. And so it was really kind of difficult that I had to go through and I had to separate what was this like fake society of theirs. No offense to them in calling it fake, um, but I had to kind of separate like what is actually the real corporate governing documents here and how are they complying and are they in compliance with what they're supposed to versus what are some things that are still important policies to them and the operations of their organization but are not necessarily important for these purposes. Could they call the president king? <laughs> you know, I learned many a title not that day. I was reading about society seneschals and um, other titles that I prefer not to remember. but. Um, no, it, it was very interesting. It was definitely, it was probably the most interesting corporate compliance review that I've done, but um, it was, at, my recommendation to them was certainly that, you know, you really should keep these documents separate. Um, I'm not saying that they're not important documents and they're, they're not important to how your organization operates, but um, if we're really going to focus on your corporate governing documents, this is how they should be laid out um, because they also have a lot of conflicting uh, ideas in those documents. They have one document that would say this, but that would contradict their original bylaws, and so um, that that was kind of what brought them in in the first place, was they had a member that raised that they felt like the board wasn't complying with their policies. I had one that was, they brought in their constitution, right? So they had a bylaws and, our con and the constitution. Yeah, and I, and My, I say, theirs was called the cor corpora. It was very interesting. <laughs> I, I, was, I was laughing, I said, you don't need a constitution. This is an organization. You don't, there's nothing in any rule book anywhere that says you need a constitution in order to operate a business. The only or document that I would say that's not required by law for nonprofits, but that's the best practice, is a conflict of interest policy. Um, it's something that you already have to disclose to the IRS when you apply for your exemption, anyways. But if you already have to come up with that policy, you might as well make it an actual policy to adopt by the entity. Um, it's actually like on the IRS's website that they highly recommend that you adopt one as well. So that's that's one of the only documents that comes to mind for me that it's a difference between a nonprofit and a regular C or S corporation um, in regard to governing documents. So Ali, let's say uh, in uh, bay number four, uh, there is a limited liability company as opposed to a corporation. Uh, what are the differences between patient and Absolutely. So obviously we're talking about corporate formalities and most of this applies more towards uh, corporations, so what you mostly think of when you think of corporate. Um, but we did want to throw in a section about LLCs, just how they differ, um, and quite honestly most people usually really prefer LLCs for this reason because they have generally less uh, formalities requirements and as I like to say less paper. Um, so you don't have the same annual meeting and minute requirements. Uh, most of your actions by either the members or the managers, depending on how they've elected to be managed, do not require written proof of that action. Uh, but you are still required to maintain accurate records. So the LLC upon its organization with whatever state that it's being organized in 
will have to elect whether they are going to be managed by its members or by a manager or multiple managers. So we always want to look to the articles to figure out how they're managed. But really, if they are manager managed, those managers, depending on the operating agreement, are given pretty broad authority to make the day-to-day -day decisions of the LLC without having to reduce it to a written consent or um, meeting minutes. I think I just heard something odd. They're not required to keep minutes, but they must keep accurate records. Yes. How do those jive? So, um, if something is voted on, it's not put in the minutes because they are not required to have minutes. It's perhaps why I'm afraid and move away from LLCs. Books and records certainly are a large category and an umbrella term. So um, in, in LLC's case, it just doesn't happen to include uh, minutes or uh, written consents in the same way that corporations do. Um, there is, in the California Corporations Code, in the revised Limited Liability Company Act, or as other people call it, ROLCA, uh, a full list of the documents and uh, accurate records that the LLC is required to maintain. I won't read that to you in full, um, but yeah, it, it, it is in our program materials. Um, but that includes things uh, such as a full uh, list of the names of the members, the managers, their addresses, their percentage ownership of the company, um, their articles of organization, and any amendments there too, their financial statements for the last six years, um, and what else we got in here? Operating. There, so their operating agreement is a little bit of an interesting uh, concept. So California law requires you to have an operating agreement, but it doesn't necessarily need to be written. Um, so if you hey, have, John, gun. if you're you on, have, you're going on, okay, on the thunder on the next gonna, one, man. Later, but <laughs> if you have an operating agreement, that is a record that you should keep in uh, the due course of business. Um, and then for the actions by statute, there are a couple of actions that require the vote of all of the members, and that is regardless of whether you're a member or uh, manager managed. For those that require the vote of all the members pursuant to California law, those are the types of things that you should reduce to a written consent and put in writing to evidence those decisions. Before we go to patient number three, real quick, I want to just mention, uh, so, Intellectual property is really important. Um, and one of the things that uh, we should mention too is you want to look through and figure out what IP is actually owned by the corporation, by the LLC, or by an individual. So for example, I had a client come in the other day who owned um, a bunch of IP trademarks, but it was all in her personal name and not the name of the corporation. So one of the thing, one of the steps I would recommend is going through all of their trademarks um, or patents and figuring out all right who is the owner and who's supposed to be the owner and doing any assignments required um, to make sure that that's all situated and that the person who is supposed to have the IP does make sense. All right, moving. Uh, before we do, I'm still wondering. So many people lean towards LLC because there's less or no easier requirements? I think that's the reason. I think largely, in my experience, people choose an LLC typically for the tax benefits more than anything. Um, I don't know if that's your experience, Mike. I, I uh, utilize LLCs a lot for holding companies. So any type of real estate holding company, um, it's uh, you get better tax advantages. Um, also investment holding companies. And then I produce, I do a lot of film stuff, so entertainment stuff. So what I like to do is structure those companies where you have an escort um, for the managing member, right? And then the, that escort then holds a per large percentage in an LLC for the, that ends up being the production company. So, and then, um, so let's say the, the escort owns 60% of the LLC and then they can um, ask for investors for the other 40% of that LLC, so now that LLC is separate and you get double protection. Um, uh, it's a really good way to hold uh, um, you know, a, a movie entity. Um, and then also then you can also have that S Corp or that corporation own other movies. So you have one corporation that owns several different productions 
each one is its own separate LLC. Now, if anything goes wrong with one LLC or that LLC goes bankrupt or you know um, there's some sort of issue, it doesn't affect the other companies. Um, and same with real estate, same same kind of structure. So in your practice, uh, because LLCs are less paper, um, do you find that they're more um, decrepit? Um, or uh, do they look away from the requirements uh, under 17701.13? That's what I find, that they were told by their incorporating or formation attorney it's less paper, and the attorney or they never get to the maintain. I actually don't, records. don't find that it was made by an attorney. Yeah, I find it was That's, made by a, yeah. um, a CPA who. I find that it was made just by them themselves filing their own articles. Oh, see, <laughs> no, usually in my. So I find that it's. Well, yeah, that's true. So 50 50, I would say. I think if, if you have an attorney or if somebody has really drafted the formation documents to set you up for success from the start, it's very easy to maintain an LLC and it's much easier um, than a corporation because a corporation requires at the minimum those annual minutes, annual meeting uh, meetings and uh, those more thorough records. I think in LLC, if you have a good operating agreement in place, um, the only thing that I find, and that maybe I, I think Mike might want to touch on more because we've had some conversations about it, is their capitalization tables and um, the percentage of membership interest. I personally really hate when LLCs um, issue units, which is kind of the equivalent to um, stocks for corporations, um, because then you end up, I, I've had to issue point one two five of a membership interest percentage just to make the capitalization tables line up and that's that's always a headache it's not a cap table it's a membership uh um, well yeah, yeah the, their membership matrix or matrix, yeah. whatever, whatever um, you want to call it kind of their equivalent I, of well, a stock letter. that's one of the reasons why i always recommend an escort because the escort is taxed the same way as an llc if it's not i would this is the way i look at it if it's not a long-term asset you want to do an escort and uh, because it's taxed the same way as an LLC, and you get the benefit of shares. Shares are much easier to distribute than anything else uh, because with uh, LLC, you have to rewrite the operating agreement. It's a pain in the butt, right? You, know, you anytime they want to bring in any type of investor, they got to rewrite everything. So why do that? Just is, do do an S corp, issue shares, and then when you want to bring somebody new, you just issue more shares, right? And they, you're shaking your head at me. Well, for investors, the S-Corp limitations cause problems because you can only be a U.S. resident, a U.S. citizen, or another S-Corp to hold the shares. So, Yeah, but I mean, how becomes, many do you do? Uh, well, I mean, that's true, but the S-Corp... Otherwise, the only real big difference is for bankruptcy and creditors' rights, which can be a huge differential between the corporation and the LLC. Yeah, agreed, but... Uh, in my practice, it seems like most of the businesses that come in are small, small businesses. They almost always go S. Yeah, and they always go S. And it's because of the benefits, because you know it's taxed the same way as an LLC. If it's a bigger corporation, one of the first things I ask my companies that that come in is, are you trying to make, are you trying to bring in investors? And if so, are they foreign investors? And usually the answer is no. It's I might have a few friends or family. Um, that's about it, and I'm doing something small, I'm a construction company, or I'm um, like a flooring company, or whatever it might be. Um, and in that instance, then I usually say, well, let's do an escort. Um, but if they say, oh, I'm uh, a tech company, and I'm looking to expand and grow, or I, or I get my client through incubators that I go to and give lectures at, um, then I'll usually say, all right, so, are we, we're looking for money. Where are we looking? Um, so it, you're absolutely right. 100% correct. I, uh, I didn't think of that. All right. So let's move on to the next patient. So this was a real a case that uh, came in. Um, so Sarah owned a bakery with her husband, Mark. Um, and they, Sarah ran the bakery. Um, she, she was a managing member of the bakery. Uh, it was an LLC. Um, so she had all of the control over the bakery. And... Um, uh, they, uh, Mark and Sarah decided to get divorced. And so now Mark wants a piece of the action, right? So he said, hey, um, it's community property. 
Uh, I'm also on the LLC, uh, and uh, I should, you know, Sarah can continue to work and do all the work, um, but I am uh, going to take a cut. So what do you do during the consult? So the next step is we look at everything. So when was it incorporated? Well, it should be incorporation, it should be organization, but. Um, so when was it organized? Wait, are we? You wanna go back? Sorry. Yeah. So we know that it was in California. Uh, we know it was 2017. We know it's an LLC. We know the line of business, which is a bakery, multi-member LLC, meaning more than one, all right? Um, so, oh, that's another reason, going back to your original question, or about the different question, was if it's a single member LLC, uh, and there's only one member, and it's the member manager, you, um, it's really easy to do, and you can do it right on your individual income tax. It's like super stupid easy. So if it's one guy, and you don't think that they're gonna be able to keep up with all the corporate formation and documents, Single member LLC is the way to go. All right, but this is a multi-member LLC, and it was Sarah and her husband are both on it, um, and it's manager managed, and the manager is Sarah. And we're talking an even 50-50 split between Sarah and her husband, correct? Correct. So it's not an outside manager, but a inside. Member, yep. and you don't call it a member managed. Member, or she's a member member managed. She's a member and she managed it. Okay. So well, manager. they would still have to elect on their articles. It would say that they are managed by one member, or sorry, managed by one manager. It just so happens that that manager is also a member. Correct. Thank you. It would only be member managed if it's managed by all of the members of the LLC. So they all have an equal right to manage the, the business and operations of the LLC. Correct. Thank you. So we get all the documents, um, do exactly what Ali does for the corporations. We go through everything, kind of pick it apart, figure out what's, uh, um, what's legit, what's not legit. And in this case, there's no operating agreement. So if there's no obligation, uh, I'm, uh, only the articles of organization are actually um, done. So they've only submitted through the Secretary of State. We don't have an operating agreement, um, no minutes, nothing, right? Got zero documentation other than their article is the most basic form of <laughs> document, right. right? So then the question is, well, is it an LLC? What do you guys, before you move on, what do you guys think? Is it a valid LLC? Yes. If there's no other documents, right? All we have is the, uh, that's cheating, because you do this. <laughs> um, so, what do you guys think? Some people, you're, you're shaking you're your head. It's yes, what do you think? You're shaking your head, that's because David said it. <laughs> what do you think? Yes. All right, are we all in agreement that it is? You would be correct. So, um, yes, there is a valid LLC. Because, as Ali pointed out earlier, um, <laughs> California law does not require LLCs to adopt a written operating agreement. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't one, right? It could be oral, but... In this instance, good. it sounds like Sarah and Mark said our agreement is that we have an LLC and that Sarah's going to do literally everything for it and Mark's going to hang out. Right. So, Orally agreed to that. So then, what's the solution? It's a code agreement. It's a code agreement, yeah. You gotta, I mean, you've adopted all the rules that are in the code, and that's your operating agreement until you vary them. So we call those the default rules that are uh, found mm -hmm. in the in Rolka. It's our second to last bullet point. Yeah, 17701. Um, so by default, there's an operating agreement, and it's like David pointed out, it's a code agreement. Um, and uh, so the question then still remains what do we do? Right? So. If we want to get rid of Mark, what do we have to do? Pay him off. <laughs> we got to pay him off. And then, in this instance, it was a motorcycle. So Sarah had, <laughs> Sarah had a motorcycle, or had his motorcycle, and she, um, we decided to, um, you know, basically trade his interests in the company for um, this antique motorcycle that he really wanted, um, and that was the buyout. And then we utilized a family law attorney to basically structure that deal. So we had to bring in, so you had two, right? So we had family law, a bunch of family law issues, and we had um, 
um, corporate issues all at the same time. Right? So, and that's the other thing about business law is you can always bring in outside experts uh, who you know, know more than you do and, and can kind of walk you through the, the um, case. Yeah? If, if an agreement cannot be reached, Good question. The default rules say, well, you just need to pay him off. No, or the default rule is that he's still part of the company. So, the, so she's doing all the work, so then shut, shut it down, and she just needs to start over. That's right. But even shutting it down can be difficult because the um, California rules are going to say that you have to have a unanimous vote to dissolve that LLC. So potentially, if Marx is stand out and he really wants to make this difficult, he's going to say, no, I won't, I won't consent to that. And then you're really stuck in a difficult position. Which is why we think it's heavily advisable to have a written operating agreement and to really provide for ahead of time what are going to be those triggering events such as divorce and what is supposed to happen upon divorce. And you know, I, that friend that I had that she formed an LLC with another friend and is going to be involved in uh, business with that friend and that friend's family, I said, you need an operating agreement. She's like, do you think we really need it? And I'm like, no, I'm serious, you really need it. Especially if you're going to go into business with friends and family, I think we all know it's a tough uh, mix and it's, it is it is very smart. And that's largely what I do and it sounds like what Mike does as well is we're, we're trying to plan and we're trying to set you up for the best case scenario. Even if you think that that person your spouse, your brother, your parent is, you know, that you're never going to have a disagreement or that if you did have a disagreement that they would be reasonable about it, that's a, that's a bold assumption to make. When we start, uh, when I think both of us start corporations, uh, we always, I, I do a spousal agreement, I don't know if you, so I always make them sign a spousal agreement, um, which basically covers what's going to happen um, should there be a divorce. Um, so when you start the corporation, you get to make those decisions, right? You get to kind of dictate what happens and how it's gonna happen and what documents your, your client signs. But this Benjamin Button analogy is, what happens when you inherit or you get these clients where nothing has been done, um, but there's an issue? Um, and one of the, one of the, do you get corporate divorces? I call them corporate divorces. Where you get two people who are like, you get an LLC who, so I had this one LLC come in and they said, uh, I own 70% and my partner owns 30% and um, uh, I wanna make sure that I, I get the 70% because we don't like each other anymore and we're going our own way. Corporate divorce, right? He gave me all the documents. He literally like threw the documents on my desk kind of thing and he's like, this is all my stuff. Go through it and tell me what I need to do. Okay. I open it up. It's a uh, legal zoom. <laughs> and, uh, Nothing is signed. Not zip, zero, zilch. There's not one signature on any page. And I said, uh, nothing is signed. It's like, well, I'll sign it now. I'm like, eh, it's too late now, <laughs> right? Your, your partner was supposed to sign it too. So he ended up giving them 50% uh, and they ended up going 50-50. Um, so, That's where those default rules come into place, that if you don't provide for anything outside of the default rules, you really get kind of screwed with those default rules. Um, you know, if you went in with a deal and a an offer in prayer your that you're 70-30, but you don't have anything that properly evidences that, then the assumption is that you're 50-50. What are the other downsides of the default rules? I mean, the default rules are obviously created to operate um, and you know they're, they're not necessarily bad but it, they're just very general and so they don't provide for the nuanced situations that you commonly come across with your actual clients in, in actual practice um, especially you know if you have say um, uh, an entity is being formed and your client is really the person that brings the experience the knowledge the this the that but then they needed the money to get it funded so they have a partner that comes in that's really just the money um, and they don't enter into an operating agreement, they don't provide for anything other than the default rules, well then your client might kind of end up in a bad position even though they're the ones that have done the majority of the work and have made the business what it is. By presumption of law, they're gonna have an equal ownership and an equal uh, revenue sharing to that person who came in and maybe gave them 10,000 bucks. So 50-50 uh, on ownership, what does the default say in terms of management? I believe the default management is member managed. 
I don't have to look and, and I can't recall off the top of my head. I believe the, the default role is member management. So then that also means that um, if you don't elect a manager, that all of the members of the LLC have an equal right to manage the LLC and to make decisions on behalf of the LLC. And especially if you're in a situation where it's only two members, that can easily lead to deadlock so quickly if there's only a two person vote. And if you don't have an operating agreement to tell you what happens in the event of deadlock, then you're also kind of stuck. And then it, then it becomes really hard to get any business done or anything done. So. so after, I think, let me go back real quick. So, <laughs> um, Mike, no, no, no. Mike, um, after you, you know, you get the buyout done and you get all of those documents through and now Mark's gone and he's happy with his miniature motorbike here, um, what do you do going forward with uh, Sarah and her LLC? So you rewrite everything. So you got to basically go back to, the, even though it's still a continuing business, um, you basically rewrite the bylaw or the articles. Um, you make sure that she has 100% ownership, uh, that Mark's signed off on everything, that everything is uh, official. You tell her that if she brings in anybody, she actually ended up bringing in her sister. So basically she got rid of Mark. In real life. In real life. Um, she got rid of Mark and then she brought in her sister. And it's a real thriving uh, bakery in Brentwood now. But um, uh, so. Uh, she brought in her sister and then she gave her sister 50%, but we made sure that we put it all in writing. Uh, we made sure that it, there was an operating agreement in place. Um, we did, when she, she calls me every once in a while and we do her meeting minutes. Even though you don't have to, as um, an LLC, uh, I, it's highly recommended because you're supposed to still be responsible for good corporate record keeping. So um, we'll do her minutes. If she makes any big purchases, she'll call me and she'll say, do I need to resolve? And I'm like, well, not really, but let's do it. Um, never hurts. Never, never hurts. hurts to over document. It hurts to we, under document. We filed, we, filed her, uh, we filed her statement of information every year and she's a lot happier. I think a big part of that is getting rid of Mark. But still, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's one of the things that I would really push. So for you guys who want to do business law, What's, this is really fun. Like, I don't know any other type of law where it's non-adversarial. I mean, in some instances, yeah, it's adversarial, but really, you're helping these young entrepreneurs, these young business owners, try to get into, or who are excited about what they're doing. They're coming into your office because they're excited about something. There's a positive energy, there's a positive vibe, and you get to help these businesses become businesses. You get to help these people create their own personal wealth, it could be generational wealth, or become you know, job creators, right? Where they're bringing people in um, and they're really excited about it. So it's fun. This is a fun area to practice in. I have a really good time. I really love what I do. And um, your clients become your friends. Sarah and I talk regularly. Like I have... Um, uh, is her name actually Sarah? No. <laughs> Fine confidentiality. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, I have uh, I have businesses that I've worked with that I'm I'm super stoked to be working with. I mean, David pointed out that I got to help the the bar association with their nonprofit, and it was super fun. And um, just working with working with the bar and, and coming up with you know solutions to some of the problems that were presented, super fun. It's really exciting. Um, and uh, like the maternity ward. The mater yeah, that's a great analogy. It's like you're you're helping <laughs> produce these little babies that take on all the liability. It is um, a, it is a bit more enjoyable when you get them in their infancy and you do get to have a level of control. Um, but you know, even when we're dealing with a situation like we've discussed today, where you have an older entity that's coming in and that needs needs the tune up, needs the triage. Um, it, it's still, you know, as long as you're not under complete fire of their bleeding out need to be fixed immediately, it, it is a fun line of work and I, I enjoy it as well. Yeah, there's always a way to fix it. There always, there's always a solution. We have left time for war stories, which we're just starting <laughs> into, and questions. I, I have a question. Uh, this sort of goes back to what you were saying about the restrictions on who can hold an S corporation to share. So what do you do with a trust? I didn't hear you mention trust being a shareholder. Uh, well, you... So I haven't actually come across that situation. Yeah. So you can have a 
an estate planning trust, so your standard you know, trust, revocable. Rev revoc revocable trust can be a member. If you get into the more complex trust, you can't. There is a special S qualified trust that can be formed. I don't think I've ever seen one. Normally it's just, you know, folks have gone out, they've gone the, gotten their estate plan done and you move the stock into it because if the stock isn't in it when they die, <laughs> it has to be probated, which means the probate attorneys just go into court and they file a Hegstead petition, which puts the stock into the into the trust and then it flows through the trust. But the, I guess the short answer is that you can. You can correct. keep your stock as, in As long as it's just your standard revocable, if it gets something exotic, chances are probably not. Is, ir is an irrevocable trust and able to be a shareholder? Generally, no. Well, well, I didn't ask. When you die, it's irre irrevocable. So but you have a later. period of time where that trust can hold on to it to transfer. It doesn't automatically disqualify it, but if you're holding it and you keep it in the trust as like a generation skipping, I think it can cause problems. Great question. Thank you. Any other great questions? How do you deal with the new uh, Secretary of State's website? It's a pain in the butt when you don't have the new entity information and your client can't remember who it is that actually can access the website. I've run into that a few times, and my contact that w I would be able to call up has moved on to a different department, and he would like log in and just add me in, and now I don't have that. <laughs> um, you mean like yeah, when, in regard to like trying to file things? Like no. What? So once a corporation's in existence, the only thing you can do without the PIN code is to file a statement of information, and there's like two other documents. But if you need to do a dissolution or any kind of exotic stuff. Yeah, you have I've, to be an authorized filer. I've come across that a few times. It's, it is a pain, but um, yeah, what I typically do is whoever called me, I'll have them call around and say. And so I'll go to the articles that I can pull up that you don't need to register for. I'll say this person was on this account at such and such a time. Hopefully, it's recent. And I'll call my person. I'll say, do you have access? So I did this with a. Um, uh, a board, um, the um, oh, um, not a, it was a nonprofit. It was a. Have it up actually, if we want to. There you go. Ruse, the Secretary of State. No, like, no. So, so like you scroll uh, down to the uh, right, Ellie. Yes. Yeah, so here, like, uh, let's just. I'm. Um, well, let's look up Apple. Cause we can pick it up. So right there. <laughs> oh. I was trying to go for the most general, the not Apple easy computer. one. Apple computer. <laughs> I just pick any of them. Anyways, whatever. Anything active. Oh, see, look at they've got a statement of information due back in 2001 that they haven't filed. So what are you saying? Is, so if you go <laughs> so here, yeah, so if, act, if you yep. go to the view history, nope, yeah. bottom right. That's where you see all their previous filings. But typically, you would have at the top here um, where this says request certificate. Usually, you have an option to file a statement of information. Pick yeah, uh, yeah. a non-term Go to forms. Just no, pick any active one will show it. I know, I'm trying to find. You had a couple there. Right there. Anyway, in my it's case, I just called I just called my client and I said, hey, can you call this person who has access? And then that's how I got around it. You have to log in if you want the other button to appear. Well, I have Arcelli's account, so I don't want to log in. <laughs> Arcelli's my assistant. Um, but anyways, I mean, I do find that most of the time, for more complex documents, you can't actually file it on the Secretary of State's website anyways. Most of those do have to be filed counter, so then we use, you know, a service. Um, the only <coughs> documents that you can really file is you can register, so you can file articles, and then file statements of information, and then depending some amendments, but really when you go to forms, your options are quite limited for what you can actually file online anyway. Actually, it's a different page to see the other stuff you can file. Oh. You'll have to teach me sometime, David. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a pain, okay. especially with the older corporations, because who knows who had it. Know. Well, recently, the Secretary of State's website was down for all three days, and it, it was awful. It, was it made my job really hard. <laughs> or if you do a state trademark. I was doing a state trademark when I was down. Because you, you can do state and federal trademarks. But that's not what this class is about. Any other questions? All right, let's get out of here early. What do you think? Sure. Thank you. Thank you.